Hello and good morning, kind friends and companions. I'm Morgan Donner and you, you saw the title of the video. You know what we're about today. So let's just go ahead and get started and I'll explain a little bit as we go along. First off, we're gonna grab a cup, gonna toss a little bit of warm water in there and then we're going to put a few feathers inside. I have some duck, nope, turkey feathers, uh, some left-handed ones and some right-handed ones, which doesn't really matter for our purpose today, but if you're cutting a quill to do calligraphy, I think it makes a difference. But I'll grab a couple from each and just kind of toss them on in there. Some of these have been slightly chewed on by a certain cat. Fingers crossed that they still work for this. I will really quickly take a nice sharp knife here and cut off the very, very tips just to help make sure that the water is nicely saturating to the inside of the quill. We're gonna set this aside to soak for a little bit and soften up. In the meantime, we're going to grab some hot water again and a little kind of mason jar type container. We are gonna put in actually half a cup. We're not just gonna eyeball this. We're gonna specifically do half a cup in. Boop. Then we're going to take one tablespoon of rabbit skin glue, which is a protein kind of like collagen, collagen style type glue. Toss that in. I probably should have done a better job of whisking it as it went in, but too late. What's done is done. You want to try and stir enough that there's not any big lumpy bits of glue. You are going to want to let this set aside for a bit so that all of those little glue particles can absorb up the water and become proper glue. Your standard paintbrush is going to have three main components, which is the stick portion, the ferrule, which currently in modern ones is metal, and the soft bristly part at the end. So next up, we're gonna prepare our bristles, which I've got a few different furs. I'm not sure what it is, but it has these really long guard hairs that I think is gonna come in handy. Someone gave it to me being like, you seem like the type of person who could use this. I guess touche on their part, because here I am. This one is a different fur, but it also has those nice, really long guard hairs that I can use. Not as long as this one, but we'll give it a try. Now, the 15th century book by Sanini talks about how to make a paintbrush, and he says that Miniver is the best one to use. No others are suitable, quote. He's got some very strong opinions, but, I feel like exploring because Miniver, which is red squirrel, I believe, is not something I have and I'm not very interested in buying any. So we're gonna make do with what we have. And you know, why not? We'll go ahead and toss some human hair into the mix just to see, see how it performs against the other bristle types. We're gonna do some science and figure out what is the best of the supplies I've got. So first, let's just get the bit that you guys are probably the most interested in. Some hair. My longest hairs are kind of near the front here. It's, it's kind of like a inverted bob, I think is the term. I always wear it up so I don't, it doesn't really matter to me, which is also nice because I can cut off a couple inches and it's not gonna make a big difference. It's probably about time that I go in and get a trim anyway. So that that feels really thick for a brush. Let's, let's tone it down just a little bit. I'm trying to pull out the shorter hairs because we don't need them. I'm sure this is a beautiful hairstyle now. We're just going to take off maybe, was it two inches? Okay, we've got our little floof of hair here and then set that aside for now. We're gonna do kind of the same thing for our fur pieces, except it's gonna be much more tedious, I think, to grab little spots of hair and then try to trim it away as close as we can to the base. You will notice on here that, like I said, it's the, the long guard hairs are, I believe, what we want and that the really short, floofy hair right at the base we don't want. So it's probably gonna end up getting 
cut as well and we'll just sort that out. While I don't have any miniver or squirrel to use, I am trying to otherwise mostly stick to the original early 1400s instructions for making a paintbrush. So now that I have my bits of long bristle hairs, actually I probably should have as I was taking them out, it says that you should put them into little bunches as you're going and put them into a bit of water and sort of like shape and taper them so that they stick together and are kind of like tiny, tiny brushes. But you make several of those as you're cutting them off and then you put them together to make whatever size of brush that you need. You take however many bunches you need to fit a vulture's quill, a goose's quill, or a hen's or a dove's feather. So I think that's from biggest to smallest, a lot of different varieties so that you can use it for different painting purposes, I presume. Once you take your several little bunches into one big bunch and have it to the right size for your particular feather, you're then going to take some silk thread and tie them so that it's in a little sturdy bundle and you're going to take your corresponding feather quill and have the quill cut open or cut off at the end. So you don't actually want the whole long feather bit, you just want the little piece at the end that's a tube. I have a suspicion that this is not the right knife for this purpose because it is being a pain in the butt. I am very glad that I did several feathers in here because I am, I am learning as I go a bit about how to most effectively do this. I was trying to start it out with, I think a pretty sharp knife and it was just not, not going for it. It is cutting much easier now that it's been soaked for a while, uh, much better than it was when I did like, my very first initial cuts to kind of open up the, the end here. I don't know how much the water is able to really get inside. Maybe in the future what I would do is go ahead and do like a big pre-cut way more than I would need but that way it's open on both ends and the water can really get in there and soak. That way when you do your next cuts because there's this kind of white area that's not as clear as it is down here and this is full of thick gunk inside so I want to cut it so that we're all the way into the clear part. I just keep cutting and hoping really hard that I don't end up with a crack. I feel like I have a little bit of a crack there so then you're going to put these little bundle of hairs into your quill tube and you want to insert it from the tip in and then keep pushing and pushing and pushing until like a little bit of the tip sticks out. And he recommends that you try to make it so that it is kind of short and stiff because he feels like that makes a better brush than letting the bristle part be very long. I am already noticing one potential issue with the human hair versus the, you know, more recommended furs is that my hair wants to kind of curl into this little C shape whenever it gets wet. So I have a feeling that means that every time it's used as a brush and gets wet, it's going to want to be fussy. So I think the best thing I can do to counteract that is like the instructions say, make it as short as possible and hope that works. Then take a little stick of maple or chestnut or other good wood and make it smooth and neat tapered like a spindle and large enough to fit tightly into this tube. I don't know that I have maple or chestnut, but I do have some dowels that I was using in some of my house plants to help keep the plant up. So that's why the ends are dark where the wood started to rot away. Now I think that I can use the rest of the stick though just fine for some paintbrush handles. In order to get them to that tapered spindle shape that he's describing. I think I'm going to use a knife to get kind of roughly the end to the right size and then just a little bit of sanding to get it nice and smooth and refined into hopefully quill fitting size. Our glue is now quite solid, no longer liquid. It's very squishy, kind of like a very firm jello. And we are now ready to use it for our project. I need to re-liquify it with some heat. So we are just gonna take some hot water, pour it into a bigger bowl. Beep, 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 beep. Kind of like a lazy double boiler situation. This glue is one area where I am differing from the instructions a little bit. I was looking at some other people making, you know, various other historical or DIY style brushes. And a lot of them use some kind of glue and 
our, our author here mentions no such glue, but it seems like a good idea. He just says to take your little, your little brush bit here, take a stick and, you know, just tightly fit them together. Kind of like so here. And while I do think that would work pretty well, like it's, it's not just falling off, I think I would like the slight additional security of popping some glue on there. This isn't the strongest mixture I've ever made up. It's still a little bit more bouncy than I was expecting it to be. I was expecting it to be pretty firm because I tried to make a strong mix, but oh well. I don't even need to wait for it to melt all the way because the edges are already melting nicely and I can just dip my little stick into that, try and get a good bit of moisture liquid glue on there. Alrighty. And that is a lightly glued paintbrush. And there you have an account of how a miniver brush ought to be made. It's true that miniver brushes of several sizes are needed, some for gilding, some for the flat of the brush. These should be trimmed off a bit with scissors. Interesting. So I guess I was totally picturing just pointy brushes, but he literally says you can have a flat brush that you trim off. So I'm, I'm assuming that means that you cut the tip off of one to use as kind of a broader stroke sort of brush. Neat. One brush ought to be pointed with a perfect tip for outlining. Another ought to be very, very, very tiny for special uses and very small figures. I ended up making two of the initial kind of longer haired fur bristle and I, I feel like that one's going to be the most successful. It just had the most nice shape as I was working with it and I ended up with a lot of it. So two brushes it is. One out of the very teeny tiny fine haired thing that I had. This ended up being so small that I was really concerned that I would not be able to use it and get it to go into a brush form, but it turned out surprisingly well. So, you know, it seems like I have indeed achieved brush. And then of course, one that is me flavored, which is a questionable way to say that, but I have one my own hairbrush. I did not intend to cut a piece of the, the blondy bit in there, but it did, and I'm not too mad. Like, it's kind of cute having a little blonde streak in my own hairbrush. Now that I have made my own brush or brushes, we obviously need to test them out, see how they interact with paint, which one does the best. That's how we science. And while I'm gonna have a lot of fun playing with paints. I feel like I should warn you that my painting skills are mediocre at best. That's okay, we're gonna have a lot of fun. If you wanna check out some actual lovely art that is not done by an amateur, you should check out June's Journey, which is the very kind sponsor of today's video. June's Journey is a hidden object mystery game where you find clues in these really beautifully rendered scenes. I love as I progress through the story, seeing all the new scenes that they have for you to hunt in. Everything is very clearly inspired by the 1920s, which is when the story is set. You can also decorate your own cute little island with lots of little buildings and flowers and sets. And one of my favorite things is seeing what the new monthly thematic set is going to be for September. It was this super cute little German village and I have almost all of it except for one left to go. I'm almost there. June's Journey is celebrating their sixth year with a new live action video series. It's gonna have a brand new mystery. There's lots of little Easter eggs to check out. They invited players from all over the world to participate and you can participate at home with some fun guessing along as the video series goes for some in-game prizes. It's gonna be a lot of fun. Use this QR code or my link down in the description to get June's Journey. It's free to download. It's available on iOS, Android, even PC through Facebook. It's a really beautiful game. Check it out. And while my painting attempts might not be nearly as pretty, I will at least get to play with some very, very fun period pigments. Did you know that a surprising amount of pigments are basically ground up rocks? Like there's exceptions, and in fact, there's tons of exceptions now, especially with the modern making of uh, pigments, but so many of them were originally just 
You take a rock that's a certain color, you crush it up, and now you have a pigment that's that color, mostly. A very good example would be ultramarine. That is just straight up lapis lazuli that's been crushed up. This is obviously a modern synthetic that is the same chemical makeup, but made, you know, with just using the chemical bit and not needing to go actually crush up wild rocks. So that is nice. That's what a lot of these are, like the iron oxide family is a pretty big one where you you take metal which is a form of rock sort of and you oxidize it with various liquids and that does a chemical reaction and blah 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 and it creates various different colors you can also oxidize other metals and get other colors i find it so neat all, all the learning i've been doing about how various pigments have come to be and a, a lot of them are crushed up rocks slash metal chemical reactions, which is very neat. Now, not all of my colors are going to be the most period version that they could be. For example, lead white is not exactly a thing anymore because lead. Uh, so instead I have titanium white, which is a different metal, less deadly to persons. And that's kind of what we use now instead of lead white. I've been doing a lot of reading about paints lately and it's so funny because I think before now I've always dismissed them as, I don't know, it's paint. You put the color on your surface, you're done. Ta-da! And it's never really occurred to me to think a little bit about where they come from or how they're made. And so it's really neat to discover that basically all paint, for the most part, is some sort of pigment with some sort of binder. So the pigment is always a dust once you've crushed it up and so you need some way for that dust to stick to whatever surface you're applying it to because otherwise it's dust it'll just it'll fade away so you need something sticky sort of to make it stay onto your surface and it's been neat kind of realizing that oil paints or watercolor paints or uh, gouache or egg tempera or I'm sure there's a ton more. Paints are all that same recipe, just applied and most useful for different surfaces. It's been very fun. But today we are gonna go for gouache, which is sort of a gum arabic, which is a type of like tree resin plus honey. I didn't know that until I was reading up on it, but apparently these two are going to make the kind of binder for our gouache. The pigment is going to make the color part and then a little bit of a calcium carbonate or eggshell or in this case, fine marble dust, it's all the same thing. Calcium carbonate to help make it not transparent anymore. Otherwise, this right here is just gonna be watercolor. But I think that for that medieval illuminated manuscript look that I'm going for, I want something a little bit more opaque. So I think gouache is going to be the right move for us. And I love, I love, have you ever seen those manuscripts where it shows somebody painting and they've got all these cute little shells lined up with their paints inside? I want that. It's gonna be so cute. Also, I have seen a few videos of people taking old makeup or other sort of modern pigment equivalents and making their own paint by mushing the binder and the pigment together. And I'm really excited to give it a try for myself. It seems like something that's very fun. So I went ahead and got myself a slab o glass and a muller, which is just a thing to rub the, the pigments and the binder in together really, really, really effectively. Kind of like one of those KitchenAid machines, but older. Our 15th century painter buddy recommends a red stone called porphyry, which is a strong and solid stone. This isn't that, this is just glass. But uh, you know, d use whatever hard, not absorbent surface you've got. I guess. Before we start mixing in our pigments, we do need to mesh together our binder ingredients. The ingredient ratios depend a lot depending on what recipe you read. So the consensus seems to be a fair bit of this and a little bit of this. So that's what we'll do. Now that I have my little jar of binder all mixed up and ready to go, we can start playing with the pigments, which I am going to do red first because I'm obnoxious. So Let's go for it. This is red iron oxide. So exciting. 
I'm going to take just a little, not very much at all, toss it into the middle of my thing here, make a little tiny donut as if I'm making a pasta or something. And I'm going to attempt to put a somewhat equal amount of my binder in there, kind of like that close everything up and then we're gonna try mushing it together. Now the amount of pigment to binder seems to be something that's extremely pigment dependent and the particular sort of consistency you prefer dependent. It's one of those things that while there's recipes a lot of them say you really just kind of need to do it and get a feel for what makes sense for what you're doing. So here we go. But about 50-50 seems to be kind of the starting consensus. Oh wait, before I mash this in, I think I actually should hand palette mix these two together. Now how do I get this off my palette knife? Well, let's start with this and see where we end up. I'm mixing up a minuscule amount of paint. There's a lot of suction. This is hard to do. Also the sound of glass on glass is not great. All right, I do kind of feel like maybe I need more of the binder. Let's let's toss a bit more. I feel like I somehow got a hair in there. Oh god. <laughs> yep, there's some suction. God. There we go. This is like the bad version of ASMR. I don't know what sort of texture I'm supposed to be expecting out of this, but I have a feeling I've not quite reached the right one. It's kind of catching, weirdly. I wonder if I need more water. Yeah, let's see if a little water helps. Maybe. It's like already drying on the on the thing here. I think there that might be the downside of trying to do a really small sample size version. Wow, this is really weird. It's stuck. In an effort to try and get this to not stick as much to the muller, I added more water, which did not help. It's now just extremely diluted and it's probably gonna take a while to evaporate and dry out as I need it to. So that's great. Uh, I did a little bit of Googling and I think, I think maybe the thing I'm missing is that most people recommend working with a uh, frosted sort of surface, something that will still be very, very smooth, but it has just a bit of tooth, kind of like the bottom of the muller here, which you can't see because it's covered in paint, but the bottom of the muller has the, that uh, frosted glass look. So I'm gonna try to clean this up. I'll see if I can salvage it. I'm very dubious at this point, but I think my next step is probably gonna be to go ahead and take a very fine, fine toothed, fine gritted, sandpaper to the surface and hopefully make it a bit better. I do feel like roughing up the surface of the glass did help, but I also feel like part of the problem was my ratios of dry content to wet content, the binder plus pigment. And I, I also kind of realized that I'd forgotten to add <laughs> the chalk to that very first batch anyway. So I, after grinding this down, redid the red with chalk this time. And as I kind of did each of these, I realized that maybe the board was part of the problem. I think it was mostly my ratios were off. I was eyeballing doing 50-50 of the binder to pigment. And I think that eyeballing it is clearly something I don't have enough experience yet to pull off. So, I went ahead and went to actually measuring out my 50-50 and that worked way, way, way better. And I feel like they all ground up much more smoothly after that and they weren't getting stuck 
the way that first batch was, which is very strange. I had a lot of fun putting together my, my cute little palette sets of shells here. I had two different shells on hand, so these slightly bigger scallopy ones and then these smoother little ones. I wasn't planning on doing multiple sets of the paints, but I'd mixed up enough paint that I didn't want to waste it, so I went ahead and filled up the rest with these little shells. Now these are not quite dry yet. The reds, since I did those last night, are nice and dry and you can see that they are cracking a little bit. I'm not sure if that's because that was the one, because I tried to save the previous batch by like adding in more, like, so that's the one that's the most questionable recipe wise. We'll see whether or not the rest of these colors end up also cracking. Hopefully not. Hopefully the ratios are much more consistent with the rest. But now, now that we finally have the paint, the paint brushes, it is time to put them together and see how well our paint brushes did. I think I am going to use the little ones for this test round and let the bigger ones dry just a little bit longer. Also brush wise, two of them are the same material, so I don't feel the need to test both of them just one's a little bit thicker the other's a little smaller but otherwise it's the same brush so let's set aside the bigger one because i feel like the other three are a bit more comparable in size i think i'm going to go with the one that i think is going to be the most successful that initial really long bristled one which i feel like maybe is beaver i feel like this one's going to behave the best so i'm going to give it a try I'm noticing one kind of interesting issue with shells is that they're very wibbly wobbly. Oh, I lost a hair. Goodbye, little friend. Alrighty. Oh, no, that didn't work at all. I guess I need more moisture. Oh, no. <laughs> all right. Either the paint or the brush is not doing well here. Okay, that is, that is tricky. Loading enough paint on there that it wants to apply. It is very nicely opaque though. So it is doing the, the gouache end of things. Can I get any kind of fine lines with this thing? It kind of looks like I scratched the paper. Come on, buddy. Try and load some paint just onto the tippy tip. All right. Not, not uh, the best result so far, but red was also my, my most problem color. So let's see if like the pigment is doing weird things, if that's the issue. Okay, let's see if the blue does any better. Hmm. This is coming out a little bit more watercolor-y. I wonder if I either just have way too much water on my brush, very possible. Or if I didn't add enough of the chalk in there. Well, I was at least kind of able to get lines on that one. I guess for the sake of completeness, we'll do the rest here. Although I have a feeling this brush is just not a winner. It's just not doing it. But we'll, we'll give it a full fair shake. I highly doubt my ability to fill out any sort of like accurate color within the lines sort of picture situation with this. Come on, little little bristles stick together. All right, well, continue on. We'll do the green next. Wish, wash, 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 wash. Oh yeah. It, do I have too much water or is am I not adding enough chalk? Hmm, probably my best line so far. And then the black. I don't think the white's gonna be terribly visible here on this paper, but for giggles, we'll do it too. The white looks great because you can't see it. All right, let's 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 try the, the super short-haired one next. Going back over to our red. Needs more water. Mm -hmm. All right, I don't think it's much of an improvement on the splotchy full coverage of an area front, but line, not bad. And round two of blue. I do think that the bristles being shorter does give me just a little bit more control. Ooh, that's not a great first line. Oh, lost another hair. Different brush though. That might be my nicest sampler yet. 
another hair that's starting to go and it's kind of hanging out at the very end, but it does kind of make really thin lines. Oh no, lost another hair. I do think that this one is much better than the previous one. So at least there's that. Still not perfect, but if I had to choose between the two, which to paint with, the, the short one is definitely way better. All right, and now it is time for the miniature me with the little tiny blonde streak. <laughs> oh, that is not looking great so far. Lines are not bad. It is indeed kind of weird working with a cur curved brush. <laughs> Part of me is wondering how much of this is actually the brushes having different properties and how much of it is me kind of getting the technique of playing with the both the brush and the pigments as we go along. I feel like my hair should not be the best one out of these. Like that feels narcissistic to say. I'm like, that, that can't be right. I do feel like all of my lines turned out really well with the, the human hair brush. I kind of feel like I want to give the first one another go. Like maybe my technique has gotten better. Maybe I've like watered the pigments enough that they're kind of mm, primed and ready to, to stick. Like just in case these are factors that I should be considering, I'm going to make like a little mini one more sampler here at the bottom. Although for funsies, why don't we go ahead and use the big brush, even though it's the same material. Who knows? Maybe I'll be like, oh, hell yeah, big brush. That's the way to go. It's, that's still not great. Yeah, that's still not, not amazing. Come on, I'm giving you a second chance. I just need the little bristles at the very, very tip to stick together. And then I think I'd get a nicer line. I was really, really trying to give this long bristle brush a second chance and I do feel like my second try was better than my first try so maybe some of those factors I mentioned are indeed a thing but the I can tell now a little bit better how the bristles at the end just don't want to stay together. They, they want to separate and like splay out. You know, I think in the interest of fairness and completeness, I should go grab a modern brush and see how that compares with all of my handmade ones. Additional little piece of paper here at the bottom. We'll pretend that I left room for this part the whole time. All right, the, the modern brush is very nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So far, that's the best. Oh, I like your seashells. Aren't they cute? It does so good. Yeah, the, the paint is pretty, pretty dang happy, especially once it's like kind of properly bewetted. All the prior tests here are my other brushes. I am finding that the modern brush is definitely notably better. Which brush is this? That one is the human hair one. Really? Yeah, it did. I think of really the good. more historically, the DIY brushes, I feel like it's the best one. Well, as you heard, I, I think that the modern brush is definitely one of the best, especially with the laying down of flat color. I do kind of feel like the my hair one maybe did better on lines. Now, one thing to note here is that I am using mystery furs in who knows what kind of condition and maybe if I use the actual recommended type of fur then maybe it would indeed be the best. I realize there's one last thing that we can still try out. So remember how our 15th century artist friend recommended having several different brushes, one of them being one that you paint with the flat of the brush and that you should trim the bristles away a little bit with scissors. Well, I think this is actually what he's describing, painting kind of big flat sections with the sort of flatter section of the brush, brush rather than with the tippy tip. Well, that's the area that I'm struggling with. So let, let's see if that does any better. I think I'm gonna do one of our long bristle, maybe beaver brushes because I feel like those were the least successful. So I am a, 
not really losing anything by experimenting with these. I think I'm gonna start off by trimming away just a teeny tiny smidgen, just to, you know, not immediately go to a super short brush. Let's see how this does now that we are decidedly no longer pointy. As is tradition at this point, we're gonna start out with our red. All right, cross your fingers for me. Better, still very scratchy. Like that is the thing that I've had the most trouble with on this particular bristle type is that it wants to leave little scratch style paint marks, which could be good if that's a look that you're trying to go for, but scratches is not quite the vibe I have in mind. It is definitely way more useful in this form though than it was in its long, slender, bristly, pointy version. Can I make lines with this? I can make very thick lines. You know what? I'm gonna go ahead and count it as a win. I do think that I have to really load up the paint on this brush to make the bristles want to stick together and it's it's got to be really loaded but it's not as bad as it was. I'll take it as a win. All right friends we did some very solid work in today's video. I had a lot of fun experimenting and I hope you had fun watching. Check out June's Journey's new mystery live action series. That link will be down in the description and have yourself a fantastic day. Be roll. Clara. Clara, you menace. Don't boop my camera, that's rude. Clara. Ma'am, stop it. <laughs> Let's Google how to pronounce this word.